Sometimes, taking the next step forward in life means you first have to take a step back. In the wise words of a briefly brainwashed man, I've decided to go home and rethink my life. October 30th, 2012 was one hell of a day in film history. News hit the press that Disney had purchased Lucasfilm for $4 billion and that they were going to make another Star Wars trilogy. The internet hadn't quite permeated every aspect of our lives yet, so when I say the internet lost its mind, this wasn't just another Tuesday. It was serious business. Everyone was talking about this news, myself included. The little kid in me just sprang up to the surface and was like, Wow, this is insane. There's going to be a new Star Wars movie? Sign me up for that! It was a very exciting three years of anticipation, and it's a little surreal to think that the sequel trilogy has come and gone already. Now that some of the pop cultural frenzy has died down, I think I'm ready to talk about them again. Starting with the opening logos. Now we all remember the classic fanfare pumping us up through the Fox and Lucasfilm logos, brief silence on a long time ago, and then BOOM! We're back on Cloud9, baby! When Disney bought the company, they took a Marvel Studios approach, that being that their name only appears at the end credits. So the Lucasfilm logo is the only one we get, along with very minimal sound and music. The audience falls into silence, getting goosebumps of anticipation. A long time ago, and then... BOOM! If I had to choose only one, I would probably go with Fox, but the new version builds hype in an entirely different way, so there's room for both of them in my heart. Now, without further ado, Star Wars Episode 7, The Force Awakens. The remnants of the Galactic Empire have reassembled as the First Order. They really waited three decades to come back and tell the galaxy, AND ANOTHER THING! Both the First Order and the New Republic's secret military, the Resistance, are trying to find Luke Skywalker who has mysteriously vanished. A Resistance pilot, Poe Dameron, travels to the desert world of Jakku for a map that might lead to Luke. The General's been after this for a long time. Well, the General? To me, she's royalty. <laughs> well, she certainly is that just as the First Order is coming after it. You take this. It's safer with you than it is with me. You get as far away from here as you can. So far, off to a good start. Clear setup, a point of intrigue driving the story and characters, and great visuals. They promised real sets and practical effects. They delivered, and I like it. The village elder who gave Poe the map is approached by an agent of the First Order, Kylo Ren. The First Order rose from the dark side. You did not. I'll show you the dark side. But you cannot deny the truth. That is your family. You are so right. Ruthless, cool voice box, mysterious special lineage. I guess he's got the makings of a pretty cool- Whoa! Okay, that is awesome. Poe is taken prisoner, and Kylo Ren asks him about the map. But you know, calling it asking is a little bit generous. It's in a droid. A BB unit. Well then, if it's on Jakku, we'll soon have it. Shortly after, Poe is pulled aside by a surprise ally. What? This is a rescue. FN-2187 is a stormtrooper who got cold feet at his first battle. And now wants to get as far away from the First Order as possible. Can you fly a TIE fighter? I can fly anything. Why? Why are you helping me? Because it's the right thing to do. You need a pilot. I need a pilot. We're gonna do this. Yeah? I love this exchange. And it only gets better from here. They steal a TIE fighter with all the style and grace of two teenagers taking a sports car for a joyride. Yeah! 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 
Poe further humanizes this trooper with a proper name. That's Finn, huh? Finn, I'm gonna call you Finn, is that all right? Finn, yeah, Finn, I like that. I like that. I'm Poe, Poe Dameron. They may have become best friends at breakneck speed, but I'm enjoying this dynamic way too much to care. Where are you going? We're going back to Jakku, that's where. No, 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 we can't go back to Jakku. We need to get out of this system. I gotta get my droid before the First Order does. What, a, a droid? Totally get your instincts. Should have focused on the missiles first. Go back to Jakku, we die. That droid has a map that leads straight to Luke Skywalker. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. I go. Finn awakens from the crash just in time to escape the sinking TIE Fighter. Shedding his armor, he trudges through the desert to an outpost and, by some freak coincidence, finds BB-8, the droid Poe was looking for, along with a girl. This is Rey, a scavenger living in an old at, -AT. Not a great lot in life, sure, but it does make for a pretty cool aesthetic. She rescued BB-8 from another scavenger because... I'm gonna go with the fact that in Star Wars, astromech droids are basically puppies. <coughs> Rey's early scenes convey her story without much dialogue. Her life on Jakku is an endless slog, and she is worried about being stuck there forever. At the same time, there's a reason she won't leave. I know all about waiting. <coughs> For my family, they'll be back one day. Thus began the endless speculation about her parentage, a path leading only to disappointment for all who walked it. But that's another review. Uncar Plutt, who pays garbage rates for scavenged parts, one half portion, makes a very tempting offer for BB-8. Yeah. Sixty portions. But again, puppies. The droids are not for sale. So, Plutt sends some of his guys after Rey. Which brings us back to Finn. What's your hurry, thief? Ow! Hey! The jacket! It belongs to his master! It belongs to Poe Dameron. I helped him escape, but his ship crashed. Poe didn't make it. Despite getting pretty far with the truth, Finn suddenly decides to start lying. So you're with the Resistance? I would say it's because he doesn't want to tell people he's a stormtrooper, and that's very understandable. However... Yes, I am. With the Resistance, yeah. I am with the Resistance. I think he's got ulterior motives. BB-8 says he's on a secret mission. He has to get back to your base. Apparently he has a map that leads to Luke Skywalker, and everyone's after it. Luke Skywalker? I thought he was a myth. <laughs> The First Order tracked BB-8 to the outpost. They're shooting at both of us! They saw you with me! You're marked! Forcing Finn and Rey to escape in our favorite piece of junk. The garbage will do! Loved that reveal. And the sequence that follows. Seeing classic ships brought to life with modern special effects is one of this movie's many nostalgic treats. After escaping successfully, they have to deal with a malfunction. Makes sense, the Falcon is 90 years old at this point. And Finn has to scramble to maintain his lie. I'm not with the Resistance, okay? I'm just trying to get away from the First Order. Could you tell us where the base is? I'll get you there first. Please. The Ilenium system! Yes, the Ilenium system, that's the one. Get us there as fast as you can. I'll drop you to Panema Terminal. Though it isn't long before they're caught by a much larger ship, piloted by... Where'd you get this ship? Nima Outpost. Jack who? I stole it. From Uncar Plot. He stole it from the Irving boys who stole it from Duquesne. Who stole it from me? Well, you tell him that Han Solo just stole back the Millennium Falcon for good. Originally, I was actually against the idea of legacy characters being in this trilogy. But it didn't take me very long before I was riding this wave instead. This is a Millennium Falcon. You're Han Solo. Han Solo, the Rebellion General? No, the Smuggler. Is this movie telling me there are spaceport stories of Han Solo, the Smuggler? This is a ship that made the Kessel Run in 14 parsecs. 12! And it even suffered the telephone effect. Fantastic. Two gangs that loaned Han and Chewbacca money come knocking. That BB unit, First Order is looking for one just like it. Mm. And two fugitives. 
Ray tries to help by sealing the doors, but messes with the wrong fuses and unleashes the wrath tars the pair were smuggling. <laughs> I'm pretty indifferent about the Rathars. They're here to explain what Han and Chewbacca have been up to and to help make the gangs a non-issue. What I do like is Chewbacca's bowcaster. It's a very powerful weapon in Star Wars video games, but didn't really get to shine in a movie until now. Chewie! You okay? Wow. After a little bit of struggle, they escape in the Falcon. Leaving a ship of angry Rathars just sitting somewhere out in space. Word gets back to the First Order, and Snoke, their supreme leader, drops a truth bomb on us. The droid we seek is aboard the Millennium Falcon, in the hands of your father, Han Solo. I guess even in a new canon, some things never change. We've now witnessed several facets of Kylo Ren's intimidating side. We believe FM-2187 may have helped in the escape. <laughs> Anything else? And his squabbles with a pompous general named Hux. Careful, Ren, that your personal interests not interfere with orders from Leader Snoke. I want that map. For your sake, I suggest you get it. But now that they've thrown family drama into the mix, a few cracks start to appear. I feel it again. The call to the light. Supreme Leader senses it. Darth Vader was thought by many, himself included, to be too far gone. Kylo Ren, on the other hand, seems to be having difficulty fully giving in to the dark side. By the grace of your training, I will not be seduced. We shall see. That's a neat angle from which to tell this story, and it cracks open the door for a potential redemption arc down the line. And speaking of Darth Vader... Show me again. The power of the darkness. Grandfather. And I will finish what you started. BB-8 shows the map, and Han reveals it to be only a piece of the whole thing, along with some important backstory. He was training a new generation of Jedi. One boy, an apprentice, turned against him and destroyed it all. Luke felt responsible. He just walked away from everything. As a longtime Star Wars fan, it's very gratifying to see Han having gone from this... I've never seen anything to make me believe there's one all-powerful force controlling everything. ...to this. It's true. All of it. But I find myself asking, all of that, and now he's back to smuggling? Ray has been impressing Han with her piloting skills. What'd you do? I bypassed the compressor. Huh. So he offers her a job. But I have to get home. Jack who? I've already been away too long. It's too bad. Chewie kind of likes you. What? They've barely interacted. Han, are you refusing to be emotionally vulnerable again? Han brings Finn and Rey to a castle cantina on Takadana. He asks its owner, an old friend of his named Maz Kanata. Han Solo! Oh boy. Hey Maz! To get BB-8 onto a ship that won't be tracked as easily as the Falcon. No. You've been running away from this fight for too long. Go home. Leia doesn't want to see me. Too bad, Solo. We need that sweet nostalgia. Maz doesn't stop there, taking aim at Finn next. If you live long enough, you see the same eyes in different people. I'm looking at the eyes of a man who wants to run. You don't know the First Order like I do. They'll slaughter us. We all need to run. Ray tries to stop Finn from leaving, so he finally tells her the truth. I'm a stormtrooper. I wasn't gonna kill for them. So I ran right into you. You looked at me like no one ever had. I'm done with the First Order. I'm never going back. It's really great to see that the concept of a deserting stormtrooper is already starting to pay off on its potential. But showing the conflict he feels in his choice really sells it, especially with how he latched onto Rey. Don't go. Take care of yourself. Even if the light romantic subtext feels unnecessary. Got a boyfriend? Cute boyfriend? You could have had a cute boyfriend if Disney wasn't led by a bunch of cowards. Fresh on the heels of that, Rey starts hearing voices that lead her into the lower levels of the castle, where she finds the lightsaber that Luke lost on Bespin three decades ago. While it's probably not important how Maz ended up with it, 
teasing us was unnecessary. Where'd you get that? A good question. For another time. Seven years later, and they still haven't written that story. Touching the lightsaber triggers a vision showing what happened to Luke, as well as flashes of Kylo Ren and Rey. <laughs> Quiet, girl. And voices from the past. Even knowing the backstory and payoff for this vision sequence, I still think it holds up pretty well. Now, it's Ray's turn to face the harsh truth. Whomever you're waiting for on Jakku, they're never coming back. But there's someone who still could. The Saber. Take it. I don't want any part of this. It, it... Meanwhile, the First Order prepares to fire their ultimate weapon, Starkiller Base, at the capital world of the New Republic, Hosnian Prime. All remaining systems will bow to the First Order! And will remember this as the last day of the Republic! First Order, they've done it. I'll cut to the chase. It's another Death Star. And even now, I still feel a little, hmm, about it. However. It's kind of hardcore that Starkiller is a hollowed out planet, and it's supposedly Ilum, which is a really fitting choice. Furthermore, it can fire across the galaxy rather than having to move like the Death Star did, and it can destroy whole star systems. Lastly, showing the surface of the planet being destroyed is a very meaningful update to the base concept. Granted, Alderaan was Leia's homeworld, so the audience doesn't get as much of a personal connection in the case of Hosnian Prime, but it's still millions of deaths, and seeing their terror in these final moments makes for a pretty effective gut punch. And apparently during development, they nearly put Coruscant in the line of fire. The story beat is the same either way, but if I told you that Coruscant getting blown up wouldn't have broken my fanboy heart just a little bit, I would be lying. A First Order agent spots BB-8, so their troops arrive and attack the castle. With Rey having run off, Maz gives Finn the lightsaber, leading to this iconic clash. Raider! At a glance, stormtroopers are usually seen as just the generic bad guys, so one of them recognizing Finn and getting pissed enough that he drops his blaster to physically beat the crap out of him? A lot of storytelling happened here, and yet the only word that was spoken was traitor. The First Order overwhelms our heroes, but their victory is stolen by the Resistance, who also got a tip about BB-8. <laughs> Also, Poe Dameron isn't dead! Unfortunately, Kylo Ren found Rey in the woods. The map. You've seen it. And takes her in for questioning. The movie tries to cheer us up by feeding us a little bit more nostalgia. Goodness. Han Solo, it is I, C-3PO. You probably don't recognize me because of the red arm. It works for a bit, but it's difficult to stay happy when Han and Leia are regretting their life choices. Every time you look at me, you're reminded of him. I just never should have sent him away. That's when I lost him. That's when I lost you both. And R2-D2 is in the droid equivalent of a coma. R2-D2 has been in low power mode ever since Master Luke went away. Sadly, he may never be his old self again. I know bad things happening to characters is the foundation of drama, pretty much, but come on, they, they had Return of the Jedi. That was their happy ending. And now this is just basically ripping all that away. After a more joyful reunion... Oh, Dameron, you're alive? Buddy, so are you. What happened to you? What happened? I got thrown from the crash. I woke up at night, no you, no ship, nothing. You completed my mission, Finn. That's my jacket. Oh, oh. No, 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 no. Keep it, it suits you. Finn briefs the resistance on Starkiller base so that they can attack it. It uses the power of the sun. As the weapon is charged, the sun is drained until it disappears. 
Batman. I made this shortly after the movie came out, and let me tell you, getting to share it in this video brings me a very special kind of joy. In order for that amount of power to be contained, that base has to have some kind of thermal oscillator. If we can destroy that oscillator, it might destabilize the core and cripple the weapon. Maybe the planet. They have defensive shields that our ships cannot penetrate. I can disable the shields, but I have to be there on the planet. We'll get you there. On how? If I told you, you wouldn't like it. Meanwhile, Rey is at the mercy of Kylo Ren, who tries to lower her guard by taking off his mask. Despite finding a few things... Han Solo. I feel like he's the father you never had. He would have disappointed you. Get out of my head. Kylo can't get the information he needs. And even worse... You're afraid... that you will never be as strong as Darth Vader. <laughs> This is both a very interesting complex for a character to have, and really easy to make jokes about. While Kylo runs to Snoke about this development, She is strong with the Force. Untrained, but stronger than she knows. Bring her to me. Rey explores what she can do now that she's tapped into the Force. You will remove these restraints and- Leave the cell with the door open. And you'll drop your weapon? And I'll drop my weapon. The Falcon crew makes a very bumpy landing. Their shields have a fractional refresh rate. Keeps anything traveling slower than light speed from getting through. We're making our landing approach at light speed. Finn, despite claiming otherwise, doesn't actually know how to disable the shields. I'm just here to get Ray. You're killing him, Finn. Literally. The galaxy is coming on us. Solo, we'll figure it out. We'll use the Force. That's not how the Force works. And now Han Solo is an authority on the Force. This is too rich. They still have to deal with the shields, so they corner Captain Phasma. You remember me? FN2187. Not anymore. Whom I must now give a very belated introduction. Phasma is a very high-ranked commander in the First Order, indicated by the fact that she's the only character who gets to wear the shiny chrome armor. Her main role thus far has been to criticize Finn. Submit your blaster for inspection. Yes, Captain. And who gave you permission to remove that helmet? No prior signs of nonconformity. This was his first offense. Alas, her only other function in the story is to lower the shields before getting tossed aside. Is there a garbage chute? Trash compactor? It would have been an absolute waste if this character didn't return for the sequel. While the First Order charges their weapon, the Resistance launches an attack on Starkiller Base. Hot direct hit! <laughs> but no damage! When the sun is gone, that weapon will be ready to fire. But as long as there's light, we got a chance! After reuniting with Rey, Han suggests planting explosives inside the oscillator to help turn the tide, which leads to a fateful encounter. Ben! They named him after Ben Kenobi. That's a little funky, because in the old canon that was something that Luke did, but you know what? I still really like it here. Take off that mask. What do you think you'll see if I do? The face of my son. By a certain point in the runtime, I think a lot of people knew this was coming. Han's son being on the dark side, Leia encouraging him to reach out. If you see our son, bring him home. Standing on a catwalk over a chasm, Harrison Ford trying to kill Han off in the original trilogy, the signs were all there. More important though is the fact that it is very well executed. The quiet atmosphere, the other characters watching from afar, the dying sun visualizing Kylo Ren's turning point, and the performances, particularly Adam Driver. I'm being torn apart. I know what I have to do, but I don't know if I have the strength to do it. Can you help me? Yes, anything. This moment is crucial, and it was given the weight it needed. I remember thinking on premiere night, no, 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 no. If Chewie dies too, I'm gonna riot. Also, it really says something that Kylo Ren only budged a little bit when shot with the bowcaster. You know, this thing. The planted explosives clear the way for the X-Wings to do some actual damage. And yet somehow, this movie's version of the trench run on its own hardcore version of the Death Star 
ends up feeling like a side note. Even Kylo Ren took it personally? These New Age space Nazis have a real sense of pride, don't they? After enduring us making fun of it for a year and a half, Kylo's fight with Finn demonstrates the tactical perk of a crossguard lightsaber. Before trying to reclaim his family heirloom. Growing up, the lightsaber fights I geeked out about the most were the ones in the prequel trilogy. They were more elaborate and cool looking compared to the ones in the original trilogy, which weren't as flashy. As the years have gone by, I've had to acknowledge those fights weren't always emotionally interesting. The original trilogy fights had a lot of good dialogue showcasing a conflict beyond just the fact that the combatants were enemies. So to me, seeing this movie for the first time, it felt like the sequel trilogy was doing its best to strike a good balance between the two concepts. Kylo Ren vs. Finn, and especially Rey, accents the emotional aftermath of Han's death with very visceral choreography. Also, did I mention the planet is collapsing? <laughs> You need a teacher! I could show you the ways of the Force! Pro tip. Do not remind your opponent about the tools they can use against you. <laughs> After being separated by a split in the landscape, each of them are rescued by their respective allies. The collapse of the planet has begun. Leave the base at once and come to me with Kylo Ren. It is time to complete his training. Returning to base, Finn is in really bad shape medically, while Rey's wounds are more on the emotional side. I absolutely agree with the masses saying that Chewie should have hugged Leia in this scene. But let's take it a step further. While they're hugging, cut to Rey watching them. She's shaken over what happened, of course, but also feels a little bit out of place. Then Leia and Chewie, the compassionate souls that they are, invite her into the hug, showing this scavenger who grew up waiting for her family to come back for her that she might just have a new place to belong. More on that in my next review. R2-D2 finally wakes up and, oh, what's this? It is complete. Luke. There does exist an in-universe reason why R2 has the rest of the map, but it is still a big heaping spoonful of plot convenience. Rey and Chewie follow the chart to an island on the planet Octo, where Rey has to walk up a bunch of stone steps. Great for building anticipation, but a nightmare to watch for anybody who remembers that one time they skipped leg day. And finally, there he is, Luke Skywalker. An image of this costume leaked online before the movie came out, and when I realized it wasn't fake after all, I kicked myself a little bit for looking at it. But you know what? It did not diminish how epic it felt to witness this moment for the first time. So that was Star Wars Episode 7, The Force Awakens. Let's state the obvious first. A droid carrying important information, a planet-killing weapon, a new version of the Rebels and the Empire, this movie was full of direct parallels to the original trilogy. In particular, it borrows its plot structure from A New Hope. Some hypothesize that this was intentional because many Star Wars fans felt burned by the prequel trilogy, and this needed to feel like classic Star Wars in order to win them back. The great irony about this is that my generation grew up liking the prequels, and now Lucasfilm has entered an age where they want to capitalize on our nostalgia. And that's the bittersweet truth. No matter how much we claim nostalgia is a cheap tactic, it's very good at selling stuff to us. But after the glow of nostalgia starts to fade, we're left to ask ourselves, is the movie still good? I think it is. In terms of sequels that are basically remakes, I have seen far worse. More importantly, The Force Awakens is still entertaining on repeat viewings. Through charisma, intrigue, and raw emotional power, the new characters made a strong first impression. The performances were great across the board, and the cast had excellent chemistry. 
The humor felt mostly organic, its pacing was really well balanced, consistently keeping interest and never quite feeling like it's dragging. But most importantly, it made me feel excited to be watching Star Wars again. Not that there was ever a period of time where I wasn't watching it, but this was different. The sequel trilogy is part of the main saga. That meant it was likely to leave a bigger pop cultural footprint than the books, comics, and shows that were happening in this new era of Star Wars. As I continue discussing the sequel trilogy, I may double back and talk about how those films affected my perception of this one. As for the movie that we got in 2015, it had promising ideas and tantalizing possibilities for where these events and characters could go. And aside from the fact that it leaned a bit too heavily on the nostalgia, that's exactly what I wanted it to do. It's not perfect, but ultimately, I was satisfied. And with the new generation of Star Wars, comes a new generation of plot holes. How did Rey get so good at everything? Rey is often criticized as a character for being too powerful and too skilled. This always annoyed me because a lot of this criticism is made in bad faith. Through either a double standard of excessively scrutinizing female characters for being competent, or an audience simply refusing to suspend their disbelief. It doesn't have to make sense. It's entertainment. But as much as this train of thought annoys me, it is not entirely without merit. So, let's run through those points. How does Rey handle herself so well in a fight? She has lived a largely self-sufficient life in a harsh environment from a very early age. Any character who grows up like this either adapts, or they die. How is Rey such a good pilot slash mechanic? Understanding the ships, droids, and machines that she scavenges would naturally be crucial to making sure she can grab the best parts. She has also fixed and trained with flight simulators, but this isn't shown or explained in the movie itself. How did she pick up on using the Force so quickly? Rey does know stories about the Jedi, Maz told her a bit about the Force, and Kylo Ren used it against her. How did you get away? I can't explain it, and you wouldn't believe it. Her knowledge was limited, but she knew enough to take shots in the dark and hope for the best. How does Rey have a fluent understanding of droid speak and Shri Wook? The droid speak might have something to do with her being a scavenger. Shri Wook, on the other hand, I got nothing. In the time you've been away, things have changed. And so have you. You can't recapture the good old days. Not really. All you can do is take what you learned while you were away, and keep moving forward.